Almost 150 years ago, he reached the distant shores in the northeast of New Guinea, where no white man had ever set foot. Miklucha Maklai was the first. The Aborigines used to call him Tamo Rus, the Russian man, or Karam Tamo, the man from the moon. Maklai was a good man. Everyone saw him as a good man. He never turned his back on anyone who came to him. They also said he was a man from the moon because he came from the moon. He was white. And at night when you see the moon, it's also white. That's why everyone said he came from the moon. He always kept his word and acted upon his promises. That's how he treated Tui and others. And everyone called him the man from the moon. In the local tongue, they also called him Karam Tamo. More than 10,000 kilometers away from Papua New Guinea in St. Petersburg, Russia, where the great scientist and explorer set out on his journeys from, his descendant lives. And he also bears the name Nikolai Miklucha Maklai. I'm the great grand nephew of that very celebrated Nikolai Miklucha Maklai. In our family, we have two branches, an Australian one, starting with his sons Alexander and Vladimir, who were brought to Australia by Maklai's spouse, Margaret, after his death, and another branch coming from his elder brother, Sergei. This is a Russian branch, as the full namesake of Nikolai I definitely bear full responsibility for continuing his work and telling the new generation about his effort in order to preserve the memory of him these days, as well as in the future. The future famous traveller and ethnographer was born on the 17th of July 1846 in the village of Yazykovo Rajdestvinskoye of the Novgorod Governorate. In a noble family, he had three brothers and a sister. Neither their family manor nor the village survived to this day in their original form. However, there is a monument to Nikolai Miklucha Maklai in the town of Akulovka, located nearby. Every year on the scientist's birthday, they celebrate the Ethnographer's Day there and hold the Maclai readings that gather together the explorers, descendants, ethnographers, regional history experts, writers and journalists, as well as guests and local residents. Nikolai Miklucha Maclai was first educated at home. Then his family moved to St. Petersburg and he entered the second St. Petersburg Gymnasium. For several generations of students, the daring explorer with an unusual surname was a symbol of journeys to faraway lands. Yet what do people in no way connected with any of the places where Miklucha Maklai lived or studied know about him today? Which Russian travelers do you know? I need to think about it. Brzevalsky. Mm, there were many. Lazarev, Billingshausen. Well, the first we covered at school was Miklucha Maklai. Does the name Miklucha Maklai tell you anything? No. Miklucha Maklai. Yes, it does, but I can't remember what he discovered. Yes, he's also a traveler, but I can't remember anything about him. Unfortunately. I think he lived with those Papuans for a long time. He was a true ethnographer and thought one could only understand people by living with them, adopting their culture and customs. This is what I know about him. We learnt about Nikolai Miklucha Maklai from books, our school curriculum and movies. In the last 30 years, virtually nothing has been done to preserve the memory of Miklucha Maklai and it's only thanks to the older generation, who imparted their knowledge to the younger, that the memory still remains. So it is my responsibility and that of the older generation to pass down the knowledge that in Russia there truly are people to look up to, those who used to be the reference point and example for entire generations to be brought up. 
When the future traveler turned 17, he entered the St. Petersburg University, from which he was later expelled for taking part in a student movement. Miklucha Maklai received further education at the universities of Heidelberg, Leipzig and Jena. He attended the lectures of celebrated Ernst Haeckel, who was a young zoology professor back then. It was with that professor, with that very famous German scientist, that Nikolai Miklucha Maklai first traveled to the Canary Islands. Initially, Maklai studied zoology and medicine. In particular, in the Canary Islands, he discovered a new species of sea sponge. And it was after the publication of his work that he started using a double surname, Miklucha Maklai. Miklucha was the surname of the Cossack who, in the Battle of Joftoy Vode, captured Michael Maklai, a Scottish baron who fought for the Poles but settled down with the Cossacks later, marrying a woman by the name of Miklucha and adopting her family name. We and all our ancestors before Nikolai Miklucha Maklai used the surname Miklucha, but due to his extensive foreign travels, he added the surname Maklai, so the current name Miklucha Maklai emerged. The Canary Islands expedition greatly impressed the young scientist. He was overcome with a hunger for travel and discovery. His main goal was a poorly studied island in the Pacific Ocean, New Guinea. With great effort, the young scientist managed to obtain a small grant and finally set off. Miklucha Maklai was one of the first to put forth the theory of racial equality. He was driven by a noble goal, to prove that Papuans were not an intermediary link in human evolution like many thought at that time, but the same Homo sapiens as Europeans. Leaving Kronstadt and moving past Denmark, Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands and Great Britain, they first reached the island of Madeira, then those of Cape Verde. Leaving Rio de Janeiro, the Strait of Magellan, the Easter Island, the Samoan Islands, the island of Ratuma, and New Island behind, on day 316, the ship finally reached New Guinea. It happened on the 19th of September, 1871. From the deck of the Vitias, the young scientist could see cloud-capped mountains with a dense black tropical forest below, coming up to the ocean. The trees wrapped in vines lowered their crowns right to the surface of the water. On that very day, the first lines were written of one of the most remarkable books in human history, that of the famous Maclay's Diary. The current was favorable, and we were moving forward fast. After 1 p.m., the corvette Vitias came so close to the coast of New Guinea that we could see its characteristic features. Thick clouds were resting on the mountain tops. On the coast, plumes of smoke were visible in two places, signifying human presence. We spent one year out in the sea and are now nearing the islands most distant and dangerous for exploration, which lie in the Pacific Ocean between India and Australia. In particular, the biggest one called New Guinea, with its impenetrable jungle, lofty mountains and savage population belonging to the Papuan race, which is allegedly closer to beasts than men. And I want to commit myself to the study of these people and everything that surrounds them. In 1984, when I was in the Russian Geographical Society with my grandma Karina Miklucha Maklai, I watched the film featuring Yuri Salomin as Miklucha Maklai for the first time. And of course, it gave me a great feeling to see him on the coast of Maklai visualizing all the events in the movie. Never did I imagine we would be friends. And let me tell you frankly, he was a true Miklucha Maklai. I managed to show people how hard it was and what a heroic feat our great Russian traveler performed. May I come in? Yes, please. Glad to see you. The main character, Yuri Salomin, who played the famous traveler, was also the director of the film. 
Since Yuri's childhood, Miklucha Maklai has been a true hero for him, taking root in his heart. It was the memory of him that inspired me. And I wanted to preserve the memory of this man, make him known even better than he is from books. You see? I think the memory of such people, we have monuments, museums and institutes. I think it could be extremely interesting to students, to school children. I'm so sorry to lose such a passenger, and I regret even more losing such a fellow countryman as you. Seems like you're burying me. Yes, what you're about to do is suicide. Take weapons with you at least. No. Almost 150 years ago, no one knew much about the life of these people. The island remained mysterious and poorly studied. Sailors helped to build a hut for the scientist and brought there everything he needed. On the very first day of his landing on the coast, Miklucha Makai met a Papuan who was to play a crucial part in his life. The name of Tui has truly become historic and is invariably used together with that of Miklucha Makai. Tui was the first Papuan to see a white man. He met Miklucha Maklai and thought he was a man from the moon, or the moon man as they used to say. It was Tui who became his first friend, and this story will be later passed down by Tui's family, the story of their friendship with Maklai, how they protected him and he protected them. The 1st of October 1871 became a special day for Maklai. He visited the village for the first time. As I entered the grounds, I saw a group of men armed with spears standing in the middle. There were neither women nor children, apparently they were hiding. Seeing me, several indigenes raised their spears and some of them assumed a warlike posture, as if preparing to launch a spear. In the end, the Papuans did fire a couple of arrows very close to Miklucha Maklai and were watching him inquisitively to study his reaction. Yet the explorer found a nice spot in the shade, brought his new mat and stretching out there with a great relish, fell asleep. While he was sleeping, no one wanted to shoot him. And those who were shooting before didn't do it in order to kill Maklai. All the arrows flew above his head. If we remember how he entered the village and lay down when everyone expected him to pull out a gun, yet he lay down and slept right in the middle of the village, it must have required a great courage. He thought if he might die, death could come only once. And they didn't try to kill him, but rather started watching and studying who he was, and when they saw he wasn't afraid of them at all, they felt respect. I often noticed that the indigenes liked the way I behaved. They saw I was open with them and didn't wish to see more than they wanted to show me. It didn't take Miklucha Maklai long to befriend the villages of Gorendo, Bongo and Gumbu, so he could collect material for his studies for days on end. At that time, European books on anthropology claimed that the Papuan race was distinguished by their scalp hair, which grew in tufts. The scientists believed this was nonsense. Miklucha Maklai managed to study the head of a nine-year-old boy from Bongu, who had a short haircut and even made some sketches. After the guests had departed, Maklai made an entry in his diary, throwing light on the matter that used to worry scientists so much. Their hair does not grow in separate groups or bunches, but is distributed evenly in the same way as ours. That observation for many people, an apparently minor one, put me in a good mood. The stories about the man from the moon traveled from one village to another, breaking not only linguistic, but also tribal barriers. Meanwhile, the hour of his departure drew near. On the 19th of December 1872, the clipper Izumrud, or the Emerald, sent by the Russian government to search for the traveler, reached the island. As Izumrud entered Astrolabe Bay, Russian sailors witnessed an unusual sight. A Russian flag was flying and aboard the ship, there was the Russian scientist. 
skin and bone, his clothes ragged. But he was talking quite fluently to the Papuans in the local tongue, and they understood him perfectly. Maklai bid farewell and promised to return. Their voyage was a long one. Mikluka Maklai continued his study of the anthropological and cultural characteristics of both Papuans and the peoples of Melanesia in general. Year after year, new entries and sketches kept appearing on the pages of his expedition diaries. In early 1876, Mikluka Maklai made a decision to visit his favorite coast again. The villagers, who still had a fresh memory of Maklai, took his return for granted as he had promised to do so. Maklai visited the Maklai coast three times, spending there a total of 30 months. His third journey, however, lasted for no more than six days. It was during that time that he brought to the Papuans a young bull and some goats as a gift. The bull seemed so bizarre to them that they thought it was a big swine. The bull ran away into the woods, leaving them scared to death, but it still makes part of their legends. This land truly became the traveler's home. However, it was time to return. On the morning of March the 23rd, the scientist enjoyed the view of the New Guinean coast for the last time, and the ship set off to sea, heading for Sydney. By a twist of fate, it was there that Mikluka Maklai found his true love. In 1884, Maklai made up his mind to put an end to a period of uncertainty and get married. His beloved was Margaret Robinson Clark, daughter of the Premier of New South Wales, a high-profile government official in Australia. Margaret was born into a Protestant family, while Nikolai was Russian Orthodox. The only way they could marry was in the Protestant ceremony. That was the condition of Sir Robertson, Margaret's father. Maclay had to secure the approval of the Holy Synod and the Emperor for the marriage to proceed. In 1886, Mikluka Maclay returned to Russia and one year after, he brought his family, his wife Margaret and their two sons, to Russia as well. The scientist's health was rapidly deteriorating. The disease progressed and later it turned out to have been cancer. In April of 1888, Nikolai Mikluka Maklai passed away. Maklai was buried in the Volkova Cemetery next to his father Nicholas and his sister. It is there that his grave can still be found. It bears an inscription left by his wife reading, Nothing except for death will part us, as deciphered in the late 20th century, as well as a monogram showing two underlined M letters. That's what he used to sign his records. It was only a century after Miklucha Maklai set foot on the Papuan shore for the first time that Soviet expeditions were sent to New Guinea again in 1971 and 1977. Daniel Tumarkin is a Soviet and Russian scientist and expert on Oceania's ethnography and history, who supervised the ethnographic teams of the New Guinea expeditions in 1971 and 1977. Many islanders had already crowded onto the shore, looking in astonishment at a large white steamship never seen there before. They all looked rather gloomy, but as soon as we started approaching the land, I cried out a phrase in Bongo, something I'd learned from Miklucha Maklai's journals. Otamo kage dabe kabote simo, which meant, hello, O people, we are all brothers. Impressed by this greeting, the villagers smiled and invited us to debark. That was how our story started. I was born 102 years after the landing of Nikolai Mikluka Maklai on the island of New Guinea, which happened exactly on the 20th of September, and I have my birthday on the 20th of September. Obviously, since my childhood, people kept asking me when I would finally go to New Guinea, so frankly speaking, it was easier to go there than explain why I'm not doing so.
preparation began for the 21st century expedition. For the great traveler's descendant, it was not only important to get to distant Papua New Guinea, but also to facilitate collaboration between the two countries. To compare the life of today with that described in the scientist's diary. And finally, to bring the memory of those places back to all those who ever found themselves engrossed in reading about the traveler Miklucha Maklai. I see a huge educational and, if you will, potential in this expedition for the presence of Russians in New Guinea, in a way, continues the tradition established by Miklucha Maklai. You know, in the 19th century, when Russian Navy ships traveled to distant lands, they called it showing the Russian flag. Similarly, this expedition will also show the Russian flag of today, proving the continuity of traditions related to the study of these territories, as well as a friendly attitude of Russian people towards the native population of Oceania. I believe it's extremely important, and all I can do is wish success to this expedition. Finally, our expedition Miklucha Maklai, 21st century, the Maklai coast has checked in. Now we're boarding the plane and setting off to the Maklai coast in Papua New Guinea. We've boarded and are heading to Abu Dhabi, then Sydney, where we have a connecting flight landing in Papua New Guinea on the 13th of September at 4 p.m. That's Igor Chininov. He studies material culture and civilization. Igor, can you tell me, why are you going there? I want to study the state of material culture and economy of Bongu villages these days. To see whether any serious innovation has taken place in the region since the Soviet expedition 40 years ago. As you can see, we're taking this very seriously. There's no joking at all. You can see determination in our eyes. And here we have a representative of the Kunstkamera. They probably have an even more serious approach. Is that the case? Arina Lebedeva. Hello, dear friends. I work at the Museum of Anthropology and Ethnography of the Russian Academy of Sciences, which is more widely known as the Kunstkammer. I'm going to the Maklai coast for the first time in my ethnographic career. So I'll be very glad and interested to see the current state of the Papuan culture. What has changed since the times of Maklai and since the Soviet expedition, which Igor mentioned, to find out which innovations have been introduced. When our expedition arrived in Madang, we were met by Peter Barta, a friend of Nikolai's, who helped him organize the expedition. So we went along the Maklai coast towards Cape Garagasi on a big motorboat. The voyage on Sir Peter Barter's Snow White ship took around an hour and a half. In the afternoon, the expedition members finally saw the very coast where one day the famous traveler landed, the coast that bears his name. They did not only welcome their guests, around 3,000 people gathered to see the descendant of Maklai, as well as the people from his village, as they put it. As a mark of respect and in memory of the Russian scientist, the Papuans raised the Russian flag on the Maklai coast, which they procured from somewhere themselves and sang the anthem of the independent state of Papua New Guinea, greeting the Russians. The local population still hands down legends of Miklucha Maklai from generation to generation. For the people of the Maklai coast, their meeting with the members of the 21st century expedition has become the biggest highlight in the last 150 years. People were greeting us almost as if we had come from another planet. They were clearly interested and astonished, as they had heard a lot about the people from the lands of Maklai, yet had never actually seen them. The 
part of the island studied by Miklucha Maklai has hardly changed since his times. There's still neither electricity nor industry, nothing that could have an effect on the Aborigines' way of life. In Russia, we don't always remember Maklai. In fact, after 30 years, we have virtually forgotten him and can hardly connect the dots to evaluate his contribution. But Papuans preserve their language, and even some of the words introduced by Maklai, those were the first words, for example, words like corn and axe, confirm that it was the first time that the Stone Age came across metal objects. It was extremely valuable, so they called their children Maklai in order to preserve the memory of Maklai. What is your name? Nikolai. 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 <laughs> the expedition members were dreaming of meeting Tui's descendants. There proved to be more of them than one could have imagined. Papuans stick to their quiet, slower-paced life. They spend most of their time next to their huts and they perceive their home not as a castle, but simply as a place where they can sleep. It was the same in the times of Maclay. What is most important is that all the buildings, outbuildings, dwellings and ritual structures have remained virtually unaltered for the last 40 to 50 years. They still rest on stilts, are made of natural materials and have the same dimensions as recorded by the Soviet scientists, which means the tradition has been preserved. Papuans have also preserved their traditional men's houses, where young men who wish to enter into a marriage stay for at least a month and take part in special rites guided by a wise mentor. This drum is called a barum. It's a slit drum made of a single piece of wood, an entire trunk or log, with a hollow chamber inside. Unlike akam, which is a handheld drum used during celebrations and the Sing Sing festival, this is a signal drum used to gather the community together in case of emergencies or when it's necessary to meet and discuss something urgently when someone dies, or in other similar cases. The 146th anniversary of the Great Traveller's landing on the island of New Guinea has become a special day for those on the Maclai coast. It was on that day that the scientist descendant Miklucha Maclai Jr. decided to hold a teleconference between Papua New Guinea and Russia. In order to take part in that, the Grand Chief arrived for the first time, Sir Michael Samare, called the father of the nation and of Papua New Guinea as an independent state. People almost worship him. The idea of a teleconference between such distant countries seemed unrealistic at first. They didn't really believe it was possible. Only the Northwestern Division of the TASS News Agency supported me. First of all, we had to find out whether it was possible to transmit signals from this coast because you could send an SMS or text message, but a TV broadcast was almost impossible. So Peter Barter helped me with that. They said that the signal was too weak and brought special equipment, which could amplify it in order for us to hold an hour-long conference. In many ways, this day has become a milestone. Upon the request of Nikolai Mikhlucha Maklai Jr., the villagers have collected for him some ritual and household items used by them and their ancestors. In the same way as over a century ago, Papuans brought them to the hut of the famous traveler when he made up his collection. They are saying, please take it with you to your cold land and remember your kin who live here in Gorendo. Thank you so much. I will try to preserve this most precious gift and a piece of your culture. The work of the expedition in Papua New Guinea is over and the team of researchers led by Nikolai Miklucha Maklai are now going to Australia.
The expedition visited the biological station established by the scientists on the coast of Watson's Bay. It also visited the house of Mikluka Maklai. In the 1980s, developers wanted to demolish the building. Not long before that, the Sullivan family, Janet and Colin, became the owners of the house. Discovering that a great traveler had lived there, they decided to preserve the building. Janet wrote letters to Gorbachev, the Australian Foreign Ministry, as well as that of the Soviet Union, and finally got her way. Today, the house is under state protection. Today, the descendants of the great Russian scientists live in the capital of Australia, as well as in the city of Melbourne. Janie Maclay is among them, the widow of Paul Maclay, the grandson of Mikluka Maclay. This expedition has also given me an opportunity to meet my relatives, as well as to connect with my personal history and at the same time the history of Mikluka Maclay. So, Nikolai Mikluka Maclay had the two sons, my grandfather Alex, and his younger brother's name was Vladimir. I believe Vladimir had two sons named Kenneth and Robert, and they had also children who live in Australia now. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't meet them, but they, they are still there in Australia. And I have three children, and they are all grown up, and, they have, and my daughter only has two children. The boys don't have children yet. The expedition members visited the biggest university in Australia, where the Museum of William Maclay is located. He was a social activist, scientist and a friend of Maclay Senior. The museum stores items related to the great traveller. I think Australian scientists and academics highly appreciate the contribution made by Mikluka Maclay. I've talked to some, including those from the Australian Museum, and they said they still used his drawings, notes and analytical findings. So, the first scientific and research expedition in the footsteps of the famous traveller, scientist and humanist Nikolai Mikluka Maclay has become reality and today is already history. It's time to sum up the results. The team we've gathered has accomplished its task 100% and there's a lot to publish. A unique collection of the Maclay Coast material culture was created during the expedition, consisting of 56 items. They were all gifted by the descendants of people who knew Mikluka Maclay Sr. personally in the 19th century and lived in the same villages of Gorendo, Gumbu and Bongu. Fourteen items have been given to the collection of the Kunstkamera, one item to Moscow University's Museum of Anthropology and one item to the Museum of the World Ocean. Forty items have become part of the private collection which will be displayed in museums around the world. Even before you said anything, and I hope that's how it will be. This plate was given to me by one of Tui's descendants. He was the first Papuan to meet Mikluka Maklai. After he underwent initiation, they gave him this plate. In many families, it was used as the bride price, and in some villages, they even say it's their money. These traditions have been preserved to this day, and you know, we could learn from that. For if we now ask somebody to wear traditional clothes, it will be hard to find a shop which sells them. So we should help to preserve this collection and we're planning to put it on display around the globe because it's extremely popular. It's in demand. We can compare what it used to be like to what we have now. Almost nothing has changed. Our recent expedition is just the beginning. Only now do I realize that when it has had a great effect, when so many people have become interested in these ideas. And the white snow that we have in Russia is like a white canvas where we'll be able to paint whatever we like. And we have a lot of plans, loads of them. Nikolai Mikhlucha Maklai is dreaming about new expeditions to New Guinea. He wants to transform into reality some of the valuable and still relevant ideas of the famous traveler. To establish close and regular contact with Papua New Guinea and to create a special ethnographical park in this unique nook of the world. There, where one day, a man from the moon landed. Yeah.